Okay, good evening. Chuck, I see you here on screen with us. I, uh, yep, you're waving, you can hear me, fantastic. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are in progress now with the first uh, Naturally Speaking series coming to you uh, virtually from the Virginia Living Museum here in Newport News. Uh, we hoped to be a hybrid, both on-site and virtual for this series this year. Uh, nevertheless, our impending snowstorm uh, made us uh, choose the, the uh, monitor rather than in person. So we're uh, very thankful to our speaker for being flexible uh, in either way to share with us uh, a good discussion this evening. Uh, we're going to start here as we always do with just a little bit of housekeeping, which is that um, uh, microphones have been muted for our audience. Uh, the way to interact this evening is through the Q&A box. So any question uh, or comment you might have, please use the bottom of your screen, the Q&A section and type them in there. Uh, if you see something that another uh, participant has posted to that Q&A, you can thumbs up that comment and it'll raise it in um, level of importance for us all. Uh, we are recording this evening and plan to share that with the audience uh, next week. Uh, and uh, let's see, I think that's all of our housekeeping. Um, we are supported annually by Virginia Health Services, a terrific organization uh, that operates uh, uh, health facilities here in our region. Um, we've got a fantastic local speaker, uh, Dr. Chuck Bailey. Christopher, I believe is the official name, uh, Chuck, but he likes to go by Chuck. Uh, and he's a geology professor at William and Mary. Uh, received his uh, undergrad from William and Mary in both geology and biology, uh, and then shipped off to Johns Hopkins University for his PhD. Uh, lo and behold, after a couple stints, Chuck found that Virginia was the place for him and he came back uh, to William and Mary and uh, teaches now uh, mostly in geology uh, with work, work and classes and syllabus ranging um, uh, from geology to earth and rock formation uh, and climate change. So I'm fascinated. Uh, Chuck and his research spans from the Appalachians locally to Utah and then out to Oman and uh, does that with students at William and & Mary. And so if you are considering this uh, potential career, Chuck's the guy to talk to. And Chuck has also led um, hundreds of students through, through their thesis project. So uh, as I said, Chuck's the guy to talk to if you want to be in the field of uh, earth rock formation. And Mr. Dr. Chuck Bailey, I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to let you uh, present and we'll, we'll talk at the end. Great. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. I hope uh, I'm coming through and um, I'm going to uh, try to turn the PowerPoint into presentation mode. All right. So hopefully it'll be a big screen and we got that. And then I'm going to turn on the laser pointer. Yeah, this is going to be really special tonight. Um, so laser pointer is on and maybe you see a red uh, circle working around there. If not, try to communicate to me in some way. So tonight, Funny. what I want to talk it. to you about <laughs> is a brief history of the James River, a raucous journey through geologic time. And I am indeed a geology professor, but um, the environment is where we go and what we do. And I hope to give you a better sense of the James River over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. And uh, some of the things that we think about viewed through the lens of um, geology um, as opposed to other sort of fields of endeavor. But I need to kind of confess that I have been on research leave trying to write a book for much of uh, 2021 and I haven't taught in a while. I gotta go back in the classroom next week. So you are a little bit of the guinea pig. So this comes with a disclaimer and I thought I'd put it on up there right now. Let's see how many people are there, see how many people are there afterwards. So here's a quote from uh, one of my course evaluations. I thought professors were supposed to answer questions and teach. Professor Bailey asked more than questions. He has more questions than answers. Even when he answers a question, he'll follow up with another question. It is completely nuts. So if it goes down that way tonight, that's kind of, uh, you've been warned, all right? So I'm giving you that up front. So 
I view the James River really as Virginia's river. And I view it as Virginia's river because it starts in the Appalachian Mountains in the very westernmost part of Virginia. And it flows across the state, crossing from the, the Valley and Ridge and the Blue Ridge through the Piedmont here to the coastal plain where many of us may be tonight. And then it ultimately sort of debouches into the Chesapeake Bay. So it covers a huge swath of Virginia. Lots of people live in this region. And it has got a sort of very unique natural history story to tell. And that's what we're gonna focus on. Now, the James River starts, sort of begins its journey to the ocean, if you will, uh, here in Highland County, in the far northwestern part of Virginia. It starts at Hightown in Highland County. And from there, it makes its way through the valley and ridges across the Blue Ridge, Piedmont, and ultimately, it ends up debouching into the Chesapeake Bay, really at the mouth <clears throat> of the James in Hampton Roads. And many of us are very, very close to that spot um, here in Eastern Virginia. So I've had the good fortune of being in both of these places on research projects. The illustration of the photo on your left is actually looking down on Hightown, way out there in Highland County. And I wanna draw your attention to this barn right here. All right, you see that red barn? Well, what's exciting about that is that barn sits right on the drainage divide, the basin boundary. And so water that falls on this um, barn that goes that way to the north and east ends up in the Potomac River and water that falls on the other side of the barn ends up going to the James River all the way to Hampton Roads. So voila, that barn sits right on this drainage divide and um, they go very, very distant, different places. The image on the right is actually an image that I've doctored up a little bit. And I'll let you sort of pause for a moment and see how have I doctored the image. But this is the mouth of the James River as it kind of enters the bay with Fort Monroe and then Fort Wool here in the middle of the channel, which is an artificial island that we've actually been studying because they want to know where the rock came from. And then Willoughby Spit on the south side here. And I suspect many of you have figured out that what I have done is I have removed um, basically Interstate 64 and its bridges and its tunnels, just because I thought it kind of messed with the scene. And this is a little more, uh, you know, big scale for a big river going into a bay. So the head and the mouth of the river right there. I have also had the good fortune of being able to explore a lot of the James River, sometimes for fun, like on this trip paddling through the falls of the James in Richmond, where we get white water um, that verges on sort of class four and uh, certainly can do bad things to boats if you don't know what you're doing, to big stretches of the James, which are ultimately flat water. Here's a, an example of sort of an early morning photograph paddling on the coastal plain stretch of the James um, on our way back to Williamsburg. And let me just say from uh, I-295 all the way to Williamsburg is a long slog on that big slow river right there. So. I ask a lot of questions, I've told you that. And my first question, which is gonna lead us to a lot of this talk tonight, is how old is the James River? And probably what I should do is have some uh, sort of dramatic music that comes in here and you can sit there and muse over this um, while you're all at home on this sort of ugly evening in Hampton Roads. So how old is it? A million years, two million years, a billion years? And I'm gonna to try to answer that question, all right? I really am not gonna leave that hanging, but we're gonna to try to walk through how we might get there. And to do that, I need to give you a little background on geologic time. Here's a photograph of a quarry and a geologist looking very small in a quarry. Um, and for geologists, we uh, sometimes grow giddy when we think about how much time has sort of elapsed on planet Earth. So John Playfair was an early geologist um, and he's quoted as saying, the mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far into the abyss of time. And so that's one of the things that's difficult for us as humans to think about. When geologists will drop a million or a billion years on you, no problem. Another quote that I like very much is from T.S. Eliot. And it is time present and time past are perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past. And this gets to my thinking about how, you know, the earth has changed over time, but what we see today informs us of the past and vice versa. What we learn from the past also informs us about the present and potentially the future. So let that sort of percolate in. And geologists have effectively divided earth history into a series of uh, named time periods. And there are a lot of them, and I'm not gonna ask you to learn most of them. But if we go back into the distant reaches of time, we talk about an era, um, really, a, part of the earth history that's known as the Precambrian, all right, before the Cambrian. And these would be 
This would be a time in Earth's history that happened over 540 million years ago and goes all the way back to the very early age of Earth, back over 4 billion years ago. So the Precambrian, that is followed kind of in the history of Earth by the Paleozoic. And that uh, effectively translates as old life. And this was a time in which organisms flourished, mostly invertebrates, and then sort of curious looking um, vertebrates and curious looking plants. And this was an interval that went all the way up to about 250 million years ago. That in turn is followed by a very different era in time that we call the Mesozoic era. And it is oftentimes referred to as the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs sort of came, um, they were small, they got big, and then eventually they croaked it at the end of the Cretaceous period about 66 million years ago. And the latest sort of era in Earth history is known as the Cenozoic. Um, so the most recent that gets us all the way up to the modern day. But even there, we've got 60 some million years of time to package in there. And we're lucky in Virginia, and maybe we could also say we're lucky in the James River um, drainage area or watershed that it has great geologic diversity. Almost nearly every period of geologic time is represented somewhere in the rocks and the sediments of the Commonwealth. There's lots of interesting geologic structure. And actually, it's quite a bit more diverse than some of our neighboring states when it comes to what the, the underlying geology actually is. Along the James River, if you care to do this, you could see all three types of uh, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. So right there, the big three, these are the major types of uh, earth materials, and they're all exposed in and along the James River somewhere in Virginia. So igneous rocks like this dark, fine-grained dye base that cooled from magma, very hot at one point. Sedimentary rocks composed of chunks and pieces of older material that were eroded and deposited. And then metamorphic rocks, which are oftentimes uh, rocks that have had many things that have happened to them. Um, they've been changed. Um, their form has been altered. They develop fabrics and foliations. And they, you know, some would say have had a tortured history that they have gone through. But we can see them all along the James River. Okay, I also wanna give you a sense of kind of what I do research-wise. And in this photo, you will see one of my uh, latest research team of undergraduates, and these are the Schuyler sisters. You may have heard of the Schuyler sisters from something else, but these are the geology Schuyler sisters, and they are wonderful. And they've been working with me on a project centered near Schuyler, Virginia. Um, many of you may know of Schuyler, Virginia. It's the home of uh, soapstone, which is quarried there. It's also, for those of us of the right age, we may remember it as being the home of the Waltons, uh, a TV show from the last century. But the Schuyler sisters are trying to understand the geology there in that region. And let's focus on one of the outcrops that they're studying. So here you can see them dutifully taking notes, gazing up, admiring the wonderful rocks that are exposed there. But let's zoom in on this part. And if we zoom in on this part, I hope you can see that there are actually two different kinds of materials that are exposed here. It makes it easier if I annotate it. The BG here, is a type of rock that uh, is known as a biotite gneiss. Go ahead, say it at home, you're all muted, gneiss. And it is uh, in contact with what I've illustrated here in orange, which is a granite. Um, originally it was very light colored, but I put the big orange stripe on there so you can see it. And this is really fundamental for what we do as geologists because we can determine the age of these rocks in a relative way by seeing how they are in contact with each other. And I would argue, uh, I don't even have to argue, I'll just tell you, the granite cuts across or through the biotite gneiss. And if we follow that logically, we can make the statement then that the granite must be younger, that it actually formed at some later time after this biotite gneiss formed. So these are the observations that we make when we're in the field doing things of that nature. The other thing that we do with rocks is we take them out of the field and we try to learn their dirty little secrets. And so here is a photograph of my pocket knife and a, a large coarse grained igneous rock known as a granite. And if we were to crush this rock up into tiny little bits, what we could actually find in here is a, a tiny fraction of this rock is made up of a mineral called zircon. And it is a zirconium silicate. And what you'll see here is a bunch of individual zircon grains that came out of a rock that was crushed and then we separated the minerals out. To give you a sense of scale, this is one of my colleagues' hairs. So that's a hair follicle, right? Pretty, pretty tiny. And so these are very small. But what makes zircon interesting is when 
This grain crystallizes. It incorporates a little bit of uranium. And uranium is radioactive, so over time it decays to lead. And this crystal, if the world works as we think it does, actually traps both the uranium and lead, and we know how fast the uranium turns to lead. So we could measure the lead and uranium ratio and use that to calculate an age. And that's what we do to determine actually numerically how old rocks are. And so here you can see my students. Um, analyzing zircons using mass spectrometry, which is uh, very complicated. You need to be an electrician, plumber, and computer programmer to do all this. I just basically come in and fire the laser, and ultimately we um, end up getting age dates out of rocks from the James River Basin. So it turns out that in the Blue Ridge Mountains or the Blue Ridge Foothills, we have zircons in rocks that formed over a billion years ago. Over one billion years ago. So that'll settle in as I go to the next slide. In fact, there's a whole region in Virginia with these very, very old Precambrian rocks. And this is what we know to be the Blue Ridge in Virginia. So this region that is sort of uh, not all the way in the West, but we, it extends from Loudoun County down through Shenandoah National Park, Albemarle, Nelson, all the way down to Mount Rogers in Southwestern Virginia. These are some of the oldest rocks that we have in Eastern North America. And those rocks are interesting in and of themselves, but you got to remember the James River actually flows over those rocks. All right. So maybe that takes us a step further to answering the question. So I'll put it out there almost like a multiple choice question now. Did the James form during the Precambrian, way back in the old, old days, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, or the Cenozoic, which would make it a much, much younger river geologically? So we can ponder that for a moment. Do, 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 do. But then, Maybe I'll just ask you another question. Where does the James River flow? Where does it go? And uh, perhaps some of you are yelling at your screen at home right now um, with the answer, but I don't hear you. And it's not really that difficult. We all know that the James River flows to the Atlantic. As I am often told, geology is not rocket science, right? Where does the James River flow? It flows to the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And I've got a great illustration of that right here. See that? flows from the highlands of the Appalachians all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And that's important because the Atlantic Ocean hasn't been around forever. So my follow-up question would be, when did the Atlantic Ocean form? How old is the Atlantic Ocean? Because you could make the case that could we have really had a James River in any way, shape, or form similar to what we know today if it didn't have an Atlantic Ocean to flow to? And that's where we have to get into the, the geologic history of Eastern North America. <clears throat> Effectively, if we go back to the Paleozoic, we had a lot of uh, what I would call uh, orogenic bedlam, all right? And orogenic means mountain building. And this happens because plates collide, they crumple the crust, um, we do all sorts of things. And 300 million years ago, we had a lot of orogenic monkey business happening in Eastern North America as different plates collided. Ultimately, this assembled what we know as a continent, and that continent is called Pangaea at the, near the end of the Paleozoic period. So geologists have been able to reconstruct broadly the size and scope of Pangaea and take a look at where old Virginia would fall in the middle of Pangaea back 260 million years ago. It's right about here, would have been basically in the center of a very large mountain range and a long, long ways from any ocean. At this point in time, there would have been nothing that would have resembled the James River. Um, we would have been a very high mountain range of sort of Himalayan scale, which is pretty cool. But that changed, and it changed as we moved into the Mesozoic era, uh, that other period of time. What happens is supercontinents don't last forever. They break up, and it's very sad, but it's part of sort of the way the Earth works. Um, and so this supercontinent starts to stretch and pull apart over time. It may actually sort of founder uh, over its own weight. And in doing this, it forms a set of uh, faults and basins. And ultimately, that rifting tears the continent apart and produces a new ocean. And effectively, today, we lie on the very edge of the Atlantic Ocean. And the Atlantic Ocean was birthed, if you will, during this rifting that happened um, between about 200 and 20 and 180 million years ago. So I'm throwing time around, but you know that's back in kind of the middle period of Earth history. So 
if we think about that paleogeographically, and I've tried to put Virginia here as the big pink star, hopefully you can see that. But the idea is 200 million years ago, we would have had a, a very young, very narrow, early developed Atlantic Ocean. And that would be the place that we could then have rivers and streams start flowing to. So I would make the case that the James River likely developed um, flowing to where it goes during the Mesozoic, approximately 200 million years ago. It's a long time ago, but it is much, much younger than many of the rocks that it actually flows over and across. So let's check this out for a moment, because this is also important. Um, the Eastern Continental Divide here in um, North America is the big white line. And you can see it crossing Pennsylvania, coming into the Virginia Appalachians, and the James River Basin goes all the way to that. But one of the things we know is that when rifting finished and the James River sort of started to form, it would have been eroding a much smaller watershed. And 175 million years ago, that might have been the continental divide here in the East. And then 100 million years ago, maybe there. And by 50 million years ago, it was there. And eventually it migrates back across the regions that we call the Blue Ridge and the Appalachians now. But over time, the James River and other mid-Atlantic streams like the Susquehanna um, have actually been gnawing away, taking drainage away from rivers that drain the interior of North America, like the Ohio River or the Tennessee River. So the mighty James hopefully and likely will grow in extent um, over geologic time going forward. So I've got two last examples and I wanna wrap it up so you guys can ask me questions. And I wanna take you first to Balcony Falls, which is a, a, a big rapid in the middle of the James River water gap in the Blue Ridge. If you've ever gone through Balcony Falls in a canoe, it's a great deal of fun. Um, and you are going through at the bottom of a gorge with the Blue Ridge Mountains rising some 2000 feet on either side of you. And this is another kind of question that geologists like to answer or ask, maybe we don't answer it very well. It has to do with sort of the relationship between the river and the terrain, the topography, the landscape. So here is a map view of that same scene. So the James River is sort of flowing along. Doo, 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 doo. It comes to the Blue Ridge Mountains, it meets the Mari River, and then boom, it punches a gap through the mountains, if you will. It flows between mountains that are, again, 2,000 feet higher on either side. And we call that the James River water gap. The Potomac River does a similar thing. The Delaware River does a similar thing. But I've got a question for you. Which came first? the James River or the Blue Ridge Mountains. Mm -hmm. How about that? And I'm not the first to sort of ask this question or sort of think about it. In fact, we can go all the way back to the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson, and in his writing on the notes of state of Virginia, he thought about this a little bit. And uh, let's see what he says. This scene hurries our senses into the opinion that this earth has been created in time that the mountains were formed first, that the rivers began to flow afterwards, that in this place, particularly, they have been dammed up by the Blue Ridge of Mountains and have formed an ocean which filled the whole valley. They continue to rise. Oh, it goes on and on and on. But TJ was arguing for a situation where the mountains were first and the river came later. Interesting hypothesis, okay? But he's not quite the only one who's ever thought about this. Um, I'm going to bring up John Denver. Many of you may know his song, Country Roads. And I have uh, taken the liberty of uh, annotating this. I've taken out the word West Virginia and inserted Western, which works very well in our situation here. And I've taken out Shenandoah River, which is mostly in Virginia, and inserted the word James River because it will be perfectly the same meaning. But he's here obviously contemplating about life, trees, mountains, and the breeze. Unfortunately, he never really gets into the uh, question of like, how old the water was, but it's got to be in there somewhere. So this is a big question. Earth scientists have argued about this for a long time. And in one slide, I'm going to give you the answer, which will probably be a little unsatisfying, but here you go. Um, I like to think that the Blue Ridge Mountains formed because of ancient tectonics a long time ago. But that kind of sets the table, if you will. And then a set of later processes, such as differential erosion and isostasy, and that the flow of the mantle, which helps create the landscape that we actually see. So if we were to put that together into kind of a quick timeline, the rocks formed a long time ago. Boom, 500 to over a billion years ago, whoa. 
The geologic structures, the crumpling and the collision, they occurred a long time ago as well, back in the Paleozoic. And then we start developing modern drainage systems like the James River during the Mesozoic, which is maybe 200 million years ago. And ultimately it is kind of the landscape which is forming last in the most recent geologic periods as processes work to cut out stronger rocks from weaker rock. And that's actually when we grow the modern mountains that we all think about when we think about the Blue Ridge. And that would probably be sometime after the last 15 million years. So they're not that old, even though the rocks in them and the structures that are part of them are quite old. Last example. And this is from closer to home for those of you who are on the coastal plain. And this example has to do with uh, the landscape here in Eastern Virginia. And here's a color coded map from sort of Richmond to the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see some of the unique landforms that sort of maybe stick out to you like, what the heck is this? How did that form? But I'd like to take you very briefly to a spot on the James River where we have a bunch of very cold William Mary geology students. And they are standing, sitting and freezing in front of a bluff that actually exposes fossils. And some of these fossils I know are actually in the museum. Um, at the Virginia Living Museum, things like Chesapeake and Jeffersonius, which is a marine scallop. And it probably would have been a very tasty marine scallop. But the fact that it's marine indicates that at some point in the past, parts of Eastern Virginia must have been covered by the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And here is my paleogeographic map from that time period, showing a situation where Yorktown and Norfolk, in fact, heck, in this instance, the shoreline would have been pretty much in the Richmond area. And that's very different from today. And based on the deposits in Eastern Virginia, we can draw a set of maps. So 250,000 years ago, um, the Virginia Living Museum would have actually been underwater. Yep, it would have been underwater, um, not far off um, the mouth of the James River, which at that time would have been a very wide estuary opening into the Atlantic and there would not have even been a Chesapeake Bay. But there have also been times when sea level has been much lower than today. So if we went back to the last glacial ice age, 20,000 years ago, our paleogeography would be quite different. Our James River wouldn't be a broad estuary. In fact, it would reach Norfolk and still have 150 kilometers to go flowing over the continental shelf to reach the Atlantic Ocean. It would have become a tributary stream to the mighty Susquehanna at that point. And what's crazy is that, you know, we have evidence of humans that lived out on this continental shelf when it was dry land. So from the geologic point of view, the sea goes up, the sea goes down, and it creates lots of interesting things. And the James has been there through much of that in more recent geologic time. Okay, I'm gonna call it quits here, but I wanna put in a plug here for the William Mary blogs, because if you're interested in learning what the Schuyler sisters have done, you can check out the uh, Structural Geology and Tectonics Research Group blog. Um, it's out there. And then I also write a blog. In fact, I got my first one in of 2022, um, which is about visiting Williamsburg's Grand Canyon. And maybe you'll want to check that out. The other thing I would say is if you don't get your questions answered today, you can always email me, chuck at wm.edu. That's really not too difficult, right? Chuck, and then you put the rest of it in there. And I will try to answer things that way. So with that, I'm going to uh, sort of pop out of PowerPoint and hopefully uh, we can entertain some questions. So thanks for your attention. All right, Chuck, fantastic. That was the fastest history of rocks in the James I think I had not planned on. <laughs> right, well, it was meant um, to be rocks You have a lot more fast. to say. <laughs> I want to get into class. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on the one of your last comments. Uh, sea level goes up and sea level goes down over time. So... You know, I'm going to go right to the climate change and sea level goes up. Do you have you studied um, the history of this area and can you talk at all about the time periods and where the sea level has been and has not been? And are we just doing it again? What what's what's going on right. here? So that's a great question. And obviously we learn a lot in Eastern Virginia because we really can see the evidence of, of past sea levels standing higher. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is that we understand the broad reasons why sea levels go up and down. It has a lot to do with how the earth orbits around the sun and the moon. And we end up in these cycles and these cycles create um, 
climate differences, which affects sort of the balance of um, water on Earth, how much is in ice and how much is basically liquid. And that difference changes whether sea level is high or low. If there's a lot of ice, sea level is low. If most of that ice is water, sea level is high. And we know the cycles that work there. And we should actually be in a period of time where sea level should be falling based on sort of our, our understanding of um, how this has worked through the distant past. But it's not falling. We know it actually is rising and it's rising at um, sort of unprecedented rates and certainly in, in Southeastern Virginia, rapid rates in certain places. And we would not expect that, but we have a mechanism. And obviously that mechanism is um, effectively global warming creating by putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that is sort of driving us in the opposite direction than what we might've had had we not done that. Um, and that's one of the reasons- should be falling. Sea levels should be falling based on the astronomical drivers of sea level going up and down, but they okay. are not, all right? And so okay. for a geologist, that's really powerful evidence. Huge. Um, and the other, the other problem that we have with sea level in sort of southeastern Virginia is we are unfortunately kind of in this sweet spot um, from where the last glaciers reached. And as the glaciers pushed the crust down in Canada, it caused the crust in to the south of it to go up. In fact, I'm having it going up over my face right now. And what happens as the glaciers have gone away, Canada and other places have rebounded upward, well, we are sagging down. And if you went to Georgia, the rates would be less. If you went to New York, you have a little bit of positive going up, but we're kind of in that spot which has the most subsidence now, which is actually adding to the sea level change. Interesting. We also have the aquifer issue as well, right? Well, the, that's right. Then groundwater pumping excitement. potentially um, adds to that as we then lead to more surface compaction. Okay, awesome. Um, I, I love the theory of Pangea and um, where we are now. How, how's, how's, what's the future looking like there? Can you, you know, yeah, can you that see That is uh, a great question. And again, I was trying to stick to my brief part and raucous part, and maybe I got one of the two tonight, but it would be fun to draw a map of what will happen to Virginia at some point. And effectively, open oceans open and then oceans close. And at some point, the Atlantic Ocean will start to close. And what that means is that the Atlantic Ocean is gonna get um, cold, old, and dense, all right? We may all fear that's gonna happen to us someday. But the point is that when it gets to that point, some of that ocean crust will actually start to sink back into the Earth's deep interior, and that starts a process called subduction, and that will consume the ocean basin. That's what's happening in the Southeast Pacific. Uh, that's what drove the Tonga volcano to explode last week. And at that point, the Atlantic Ocean will start to shrink, and what we know to be Virginia will effectively be stuffed into the tectonic cannon for another episode of mountain building. And that probably is a few, you know, 100 million years in the future, but that's going to be there. Uh, we just may not be there to witness. Okay, we got time. Uh, Karen would like to know, is it true that the Chesapeake Bay may have been formed by a meteorite? All right, that is a great question. And uh, I guess my business stopped at, at the end of the James River today, so I didn't have to answer that question. The answer is the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay is the largest impact crater that we know in North America, or in America, the United States, I should say. And it was undiscovered really, or, or not known to be there until the mid 1990s. Um, but lots of younger deposits uh, here in the Eastern part of Virginia have covered it up. So it's not easy to observe, and it required sort of a lot of special tricks to figure it out. And now that we figured it out, like, oh, we should have known it all along. And that impact crater probably affected where many streams flowed, that is um, the Rappahannock and the Potomac and Susquehanna. And so in some ways it would have been at that moment in time, this low spot, um, this big wound on the North American crust. And that may have diverted some of the rivers from the North there and created a lowland, which has ultimately then been flooded later, which has the Chesapeake Bay. But I think the important thing there is the bay itself is not the impact crater. All right, and that the impact crater extends out into the Atlantic. I'm sort of drawing on my screen, and you can't see that. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you can see if I do this. 
Um, so again, it's not all of the bay, it is part of the bay, but it actually extends out into the Atlantic. Does that have anything to do with um, your, your map with the color variations in the red and that, that uh, demarcation we saw? And you mentioned, hey, what is that? Um, I'm not sure which map it was, but it could have been this map. Are you guys seeing my screen? Uh, not that one. Okay. But what I've done on this one, and you'll have to sort of zoom in. With yep. The okay, light. that shows it. That's exactly yeah, that's, what that's That's the outline of the crater. So as I said, yeah. it kind of is under the eastern shore. It goes offshore. But obviously, you know, it is like, wait a minute. You know, these rivers are all heading that way. And they probably were diverted into that low at that particular time. Got and that, that time was about 35 million years ago. Um, okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, from a anonymous attendee, where's your favorite place in Virginia to visit if you want to look at great geology? So if you want to pick a, what's a top, top right. spot for rockers to go? Okay, I can give you a few spots depending on what kind of a rocker you are. If you are interested in things like fossils, right? If I gave you a Chesapeake and it would make you dance, uh, I would say go to something like Chip Oak State Park. That would be uh, one of the places where you can find them there and the cliffs and the beach. Um, or you could go all the way to the northern neck um, out here to uh, Westmoreland, another spectacular spot. If you like rocks that are harder, um, if, that, if you're into that kind of stuff, um, I think one of the best places that's close to Eastern Virginia is Bell Island, um, which is in Richmond. It's on the south side of the James River and it's part of the Richmond City Park. Um, they diverted much of the James to the north. And so unless it's, if it's not flooding south of that, you have this acres and acres of the granitic bedrock exposed there. And there are many, many very cool things to see um, that you don't normally see. It's very well exposed. And um, if you go the right time of year, there are lots of hipsters that are there and that can be an added bonus. So it's sort of geological and kind of uh, socio-cultural and so I think that is one of mine and it's you know, an easy day trip for this part of Virginia. Very good, very good. Um, I enjoyed the Potomac River and camping up there and fossil hunting on those shores. You really get to enjoy a lot of what you do here in Virginia because it's such a, a state with such a vast variety of elevations and sea level. Uh, pretty fun state to be in if you're a rocker. Okay, um, I think that is all we've got for this evening. I'm, I'm so thankful that you shared your time with us. And if this wasn't the best plug for going to William and Mary and taking a geology class, I don't know what is. Um, and um, again, thank you to Chuck Bailey, who uh, is gearing up to be geology chair at William and Mary. Um, and good luck continuing with your research studies. And um, we thank Virginia Health Services and uh, stay tuned next month. We will be bringing you uh, some NOAA information and talking about uh, national marine sanctuaries. So we go a little bit more into marine life uh, next time. Um, and uh, if you uh, notice here a question, the recording will be uh, shared later this week. So I think we have people that want to study um, everything you rolled through so quickly, Chuck, and I might be one of those. So thank you, sir. And uh, good luck with your teaching coming up. And uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Right. Thanks, Rebecca. Take good Thanks. care. Bye-bye. Bye now.